America manufacturing is back, folks. 因为地缘政治的紧张，国家干预又重新回潮了哈，大家会不可避免的发现自己的生产成本提高，通胀也有抬升。整个制造业的竞争很激烈，关键技术、核心技术啊，要掌握在自己手里。China is actually the first mover in the de-risking process.、Uh, they got started with the de-risking、uh, effort much before、uh, the United States or the European Union did. With de-risking underway across the world. Who stands to benefit? India is in this sweet spot at the moment with the combination of geopolitics as well as domestic policies. Now coming in every year, almost five to six billion dollars investment. Are we witnessing the end of the era of globalization? The idea that you and I have about America being open to the world is but a brief moment in time, a shining moment when. Actually, multilateralism aligned America, aligned China, aligned all the rest of the world. That brief moment in time of alignment has gone, and we need to figure out some other way that we're going to navigate the world now. TSMC is the world's largest maker of advanced computer chips, the ones that power everything from phones to cars to missiles. TSMC is building a new factory in Arizona. They've already had a few high-profile visitors. And you're here because you're seeing what we're all seeing: American manufacturing is back, folks. American manufacturing is back. These are the most advanced semiconductor chips on the planet. Chips will power iPhones and MacBooks, as Tim Cook can attest. Apple had to buy all the advanced chips from overseas. Now they're going to bring more of their supply chain here home. It could be a game changer. Many analysts have suggested that the plant was built to bring advanced microchip production closer to the U.S. and away from any potential standoff with China. This state-of-the-art facility behind us is a testimony that TSMC is also taking a giant step forward to help build a vibrant semiconductor ecosystem in the United States. This new plant will be eligible for subsidies under the Chips and Science Act. That's a $280 billion pool of funds earmarked by the U.S. government. As of August 2023. An estimated 44,000 new jobs were created because of these subsidies. I got a job. He got a job. I got a job. The Chips and Science Act is not the only major industrial policy in a country that used to believe in the economic laws of Adam Smith and total free market forces. There's also the 430 billion U.S. dollar Inflation Reduction Act. It provides massive subsidies to green technologies and renewable energies. This act is expected to create 1.3 million jobs by 2030. Cummins Incorporated. A multi-billion-dollar company headquartered in the United States announced in 2023 that it will invest one billion in making engines that will run on low-carbon fuels like natural gas and hydrogen. They'll produce these engines in three American cities. Cummins will qualify for subsidies for its eco-friendly production processes under the Inflation Reduction Act. When Cummins first manufactured hydrogen electrolyzers, they had to make them overseas. Now, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, with the tax credits for renewable energy, Cummins is going to manufacture these electrolyzers here in America for the first time. Instead of relying on equipment made overseas in places like China, the supply chains will be again made 
in America. They'll begin in America. Begin in America. Then there's the one trillion dollar infrastructure bill to fund the rebuilding of American roads and bridges, along with new climate resilience and broadband initiatives. With so many industrial policies underway, some are questioning whether the U.S. is becoming more protectionist. What are the powerful domestic factors driving American industrial policy? The complicated effects of trade and outsourcing can be seen in many former industrial centers of America. After the Second World War, the United States led a fragmented world to build a new international economic order. It lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Those were the days, golden and true. This is the place someday I'll return to. But the last few decades revealed cracks in those foundations. A shifting global economy left many working Americans and their communities behind. And now it's lost on the waves of time, far from the shores of this life. Gone, baby, gone, take me home. Where I belong. Financial crisis shook the middle class. A pandemic exposed the fragility of our supply chains. A changing climate threatened lives and livelihoods. Russia's invasion of Ukraine underscored the risks of overdependence. So this moment demands that we forge a new consensus. So the one percent of the of the top of the society, their wealth is almost equal to the 40, 50 percent of the mass population. And that is really a big problem. And then all those multinationals from US and Europe, they are operating worldwide. But their revenue and their profit may not all go back to the US. So the government do not have enough uh, uh, revenue from those uh, world operation of their companies uh, to really support their local development, those uh, blue collar uh, uh, losers in those process can easily uh, shift their blame on China. Now, the political elite must adjust. I've been determined to make things in this country again. That's why the United States under President Biden is pursuing a modern industrial and innovation strategy, both at home and with partners around the world. We are seeing uh, both in China and in the United States of America, uh, security becoming a dominant factor governing uh, policy. And that led, has led in the United States to a much stronger uh, approach to industrial policy. This industrial policy has produced results. Between July to September 2023, the U.S. economy grew at its fastest pace in nearly two years. U.S. industrial policy has in turn triggered a subsidy arms race elsewhere, in China, EU, Japan, South Korea, and even India, where they are all lavishing subsidies on their semiconductor industries. The great danger is that when all of us do this, 
there is a worry that we're going to end up building excess capacity. Because if everyone is subsidizing their, their pet industry in, in some particular sector, and all countries are doing that, we could end up with a world where there's huge excess capacity in something very critical. So let me uh, paint a horror scenario. Suppose that we build so much capacity in semiconductor manufacturing that the best semiconductor companies go out of business. That's not a good thing for the world that if we no longer have advances in, uh, in TS what TSMC can do in Taiwan, what Intel and Samsung can do, well, we're going to be ending up with uh, semiconductor manufacturing that's a lot less efficient, a lot less innovative, and all that will damage economic prosperity around the world. In China, industrial policy has turbocharged the growth of green energy companies. And nowhere is that more evident than in Sichuan province, where battery makers, EV manufacturers, and renewable energy companies collectively generate a business revenue of more than 28 billion US dollars in just the first half of 2023. Just how is industrial policy executed here? The first step, getting state-owned companies to build clean energy power stations. Stretching over 2,000 football fields, the Kella Power Station is the world's largest hybrid solar hydro plant. The hydropower provides uninterrupted electricity supply at night when solar energy dips. This hybrid plant also allows its users, which are manufacturers of batteries and EVs, to meet global carbon emission requirements. The EU, for example, now requires EV battery makers to certify the carbon footprints of their batteries. And this government investment here allows Chinese companies to tick that box. The power generated from the solar hydro plant goes here. This is Suining in Sichuan, a city with a population of about 2.8 million people. And all the companies on the main street of Suining work on just one product, lithium batteries. Here, they make the cells, they make the batteries, and they also recycle the batteries. All of this happened by government design. The local government office selects the companies that complements the industrial chain they want. Those battery components made in Suining support the operations of CATL. CATL is the world's largest battery maker, supplying the likes of BYD and Tesla. CATL has a plant in neighboring city, Yibin. Again, this is the result of industrial policy. Technocrats from the Investment Bureau, Electric Vehicles Bureau, and Industrial Services Bureau all sit together in one office in Yibin to ensure the supply chain goes according to plan. We Further down the supply chain is Dongfang Electric, which makes wind turbines. They're based at the Chengdu Deyang Economic Development Zone, also in Sichuan. The batteries for these machines come from Suining and Yibin in Sichuan. According to Chinese media, there are another 2,800 clean energy-related companies located at the Chengdu Deyang Economic Development Zone. All of them leverage on a comprehensive network of supply chains built across neighboring cities. Sichuan is home to the largest clean energy industrial cluster in China. 
，我们充分发挥产业链链组的作用，与优质供应商共同合作，形成协同创新、共生共赢的局面。正是因为有了这样的合作，我们的技术创新不断迭代升级。The United States has its Inflation Reduction Act. In comparison, this is how they do industrial policy in China. From the government generating power supplies to nurturing upstream industries and connecting them with those downstream. Each development builds on the supply chains established in neighboring cities. In the last century, Fute, a car company, has a very important invention, which is 一个叫生产线、流水线啊，他把这个流水线搬进来了，大大提高了汽车生产的一个效率。那美国率先采用了流水线，就使得美国的工业化很快，就有一个大的飞跃。中国现在做对了什么呢？过去这些年，我觉得中国不但把流水线放到工厂里，而且不但说把各个工厂联系起来，甚至这个流水线，你可以在一定程度上来说是扩大到了城市群。比如说，你可以把城市群看作一个大车间，那当中的基础设施，高速公路、高铁、机场，还有电信啊，各种基础设施，这个是政府做对的地方，啊，他把各个城市联系起来，这些全部看起来都像是一个巨大的车间、流水线。所以美国人在上个世纪初的时候，他把流水线啊，使用流水线把企业联系起来，把车间联系起来。那在这个世纪，我觉得中国做对的地方就是用基础设施把城市群联系起来，变成一个巨大的车间，提升重点产业链供应链自主可控能力，推动高端化、智能化、绿色化发展，建设一批制造业创新中心，培育一批先进制造业集群。China has been a fierce critic of the de-risking strategy by other advanced economies. According to the G7, de-risking entails investing in one's own economic vibrancy through industrial policy, for example. De-risking is also reducing excessive dependencies on supply chains from one country, so friendshoring, or sourcing products from friendly countries. And lastly, protecting advanced technologies through investment screening or national security laws. These are all actions that China also seems to be undertaking. We China has spent enormous sums on industrial policy for decades. Ever since 1949, China has always had an industrial policy. It's had a system uh, where its growth was to be driven by state-owned enterprises. It's moderated over time, uh, but essentially I think that remains the case uh, down to the uh, present day. China has also consistently been investing in the diversification of supply chains. Oh, I think that China is actually the first mover in the de-risking process. Uh, they got started with the de-risking uh, effort much before uh, the United States or the European Union did. 
to a certain extent, uh, the, the United States and European Union are playing catch up to the, the efforts that the Chinese have been making to try to reduce their dependencies upon the West for critical inputs uh, that fuel their economic growth. And so there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the pot calling the kettle black uh, in, in the Chinese protesting uh, so loudly about the idea of de-risking. And then there is China's Belt and Road Initiative, over a trillion dollars borrowed from Chinese banks spent all over the world on highways, railways, ports, government buildings, dams, and power generation plants, mostly in developing countries or the so-called Global South. This decade-old mega project is a major factor in the explosion of trade between China and the Global South. If you look at um, you know, China's activities, uh, is trying to diversify as though as it's no longer uh, as reliant on the United States of America or the European Union. So, for example, more engagement with the Middle East to make sure oil comes through, the kinds of agreements it's been developing with Russia uh, that provide oil and gas and also certain uh, food uh, imports. Uh, U.S., of course, has always been a major supplier of soybean to China, and now we see it, for example, pumping up its uh, import of soybeans from places like Brazil. So I think there's no doubt that if you look at its activities, uh, they amount uh, quite closely uh, to that definition of uh, de-risking, even if for political reasons, it's a term that China wants to avoid. With both the US and China de-risking, economists have raised alarm bells on what this could mean for Southeast Asia. In the case of Singapore, we see just how beneficial trade can be. No, essentially no economy in the world has benefited from the open multilateral trading system as much as Singapore or even the region of Southeast Asia, right? If we, if we look at the GDP per capita of Southeast Asia in, in 1990, it was at the level of Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, it's 3.5 times higher than Sub-Saharan Africa, and trade has been instrumental for this because Southeast Asia has been able to integrate with the whole world due to open trade policies um, and being positioned just ideally some, somehow on the map. But if we move away from the system, because if, if the risking leads to broader fragmentation, then it's quite likely that, that Singapore and Southeast Asia might move from, from the core of the trading system to the periphery, more regionalized blocks, blocks because blocks don't depend as much on, on hubs as, as, as the global uh, trading system does because it's much easier to ship, you know, directly bilateral if, if the distances aren't big. There's no, there's no, not necessarily a need for a hub. That's why we also get in our estimates that Southeast Asia is one of the regions most at risk from, from fragmentation and de-risking. In a full decoupling scenario, we get estimates for Southeast Asia for, for GDP losses above 10%, which is much harder, uh, much higher than the global average of 5%. Twenty twenty three was a big year for Apple in India. Not only did it open its first flagship store in the country. It also shifted a huge chunk of its manufacturing here from China. It sort of perhaps took a lot of people by surprise because I think there was quite a lot of skepticism um, in terms of, you know, will India actually be able to deliver the skills necessary, the talent, the, the land, the locations, the logistics. Um, I think there was always a sense that Yes, this is mostly talk, but it won't actually really um, happen. And somehow all this is being worked out. And I mean, it doesn't stop. Now the projections are that uh, Apple is going to possibly get 15% of its revenue and 20% of its new users, I believe, over the next five years. I mean, of course, that's still maybe hypothetical. But uh, again, it just seems like the ball is rolling and quite fast. In 2023, India had plenty to celebrate. Apple is, of course, joined by many other companies. 
US-based Micron Technology has agreed to build a $2.75 billion semiconductor facility in India, with Micron spending $800 million and India funding the rest. US-based Applied Materials announced it will build a collaborative engineering center in Bengaluru with an investment of $400 million. LAM Research, another semiconductor firm, will start a training program for 60,000 Indian engineers. Taiwan-based Foxconn, the world's largest contract manufacturer of electronics, said it will double its workforce and investment in India by 2024. The BJP comes to power on a platform of liberalizing the Indian economy, that Indians will enjoy a standard of living where Indians only see on TV. Right? And that was the dream that was sold. But job creation for India has been a big problem for a long time. Is there a sense that this is finally India's time to shine? It's very hard to ignore the geopolitical background. Right? So the idea here is that what China used to have, now we got. Uh, India is coming of age. And there is some sense that this is a zero-sum game, that what China is losing, India is gaining. China has an aging population. By 2035, 30% of the population will be aged 60 and over. India, on the other hand, just overtook China to become the world's most populous nation. More than half of its 1.4 billion people are under the age of 30. It's not just about producing for export, but it's combined with the huge market potential, the huge attraction of an increasingly affluent uh, middle class, or not just necessarily affluent, but uh, a class that has got some discretionary um, spending power. Prime Minister Modi's Make in India campaign was launched nearly a decade ago in September 2014. But it was only in the last two years when CEOs and governments really started paying attention. The dark clouds of coercion and confrontation are casting their shadow in the Indo-Pacific. The stability of the region has become one of the central concerns of our partnership in working for a new world order based on international law. Our two countries will be at the forefront as partners. When India and US work together on semiconductor and critical minerals. It helps the world in making supply chains more diverse, resilient, and reliable. India uh, assumes a very important role for Washington. Clearly, um, it's not as aligned as a country like Japan would be, or South Korea would be, or Australia would be. Um, and it's still very heavily dependent on Russia, for example, for buying its arms and its weapons. But given its tensions with China, I think uh, the United States wants to try and bring India into that security Asia. India does have notorious bottlenecks, which it is now trying to resolve. India is trying to streamline the implementation of infrastructure projects across the country. Building highways, railways, new airports, power plants, and industrial corridors. It is also, like many other countries, offering subsidies and facilitating trade. What do you think are some of the possible challenges for foreign investors looking to relocate to India from China right now? Well, actually, I was uh, looking up what various ministries in India have to say about this. And it's, you know, they're quite frank. They list all the problems that you will face if you come to India, whether it's the lack of skills, whether it's maybe not very reliable electricity, issues of logistics, issues of regulation. So, you know, it's all there listed, you know, about, you know, what to expect. 
And I guess those are all sorts of obstacles that people probably actually are very well aware of. I mean, probably that's the one thing they know about India. They come with that expectation that these are going, you know, if, if you decide to come to India and invest, you have probably coming with that preception in your mind already that this is going to be a lot of hurdles, whether it's red tape or bureaucracy. And so hopefully there's an element of almost pleasant surprise that the government is trying quite hard, I think, to overcome and has recognized um, that there are these, um, um, whether it's uh, bottlenecks or roadblocks in terms of um, inputs or, um, or logistics. There are definitely many challenges for companies thinking of moving their supply chains from China to India. For example, while India does have abundant and cheaper labor, the quality of its workforce still needs a lot more upgrading compared to China. India continues to have high levels of poverty and malnutrition, with more than 10% of the population living below the World Bank's extreme poverty line. That same poverty rate in China is nearly zero. And when it comes to tech talents, China graduates nearly twice as many science, technology, engineering, and math students compared to India. China also invests significantly more in R&D and on industries like robotics, AI, and biotechnology. This is big Indian company called Infosys. When Infosys hires graduates, engineering graduates from Indian University, they have to retrain them for another one to two years to do the job that, you know. So number one was improving human resource that comes up because if you're gonna get these companies in, then you need the human resource to run. It's very difficult to shift what has been built up over four decades uh, of investment. You know, look at the Foxconn plant. It has about 200,000 workers in the Henan plant, for example. You know, roads, bridges built by the Chinese government, dormitories set up by the Chinese government. It's hard to think of another country that would be able to provide that sort of infrastructure for a major company like that. So Apple, no matter what, can't really get out of China. No matter what the bigger politics is, it's kind of stuck. You know, value chains, supply chains, it's integrated into a global model. So you can't really just snip that off and say, oh, yeah, we're off to Vietnam, we're off to India. You know, those kinds of chains which have been brought up, brought, uh, built up over 45 years or so can't be so easily unraveled. But in today's geopolitical landscape, corporate decisions are no longer based solely on competitive advantage. In June 2023, thousands in the United States gathered to welcome Prime Minister Modi at the White House. Mr. Modi was given high honor amidst unusual pomp as new partnerships in defense, space exploration, and semiconductor manufacturing were inked. Less than a month later in France, Prime Minister Modi was given top honor at the annual Bastille Day military parade. Ahead of the ceremony, French President Emmanuel Macron awarded Modi the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor, the country's top order of merit. Despite differences over the war in Ukraine, Western democracies are courting India and Modi. And despite closer ties with US and Europe, Modi has not turned his back on Russia. Trade ties between India and Russia accelerated as the Ukraine conflict continued, and India imported Russian oil. Amidst intense diplomatic engagements in Washington and Paris, there was little mention of the backslide in religious and press freedoms in India during Modi's term. Under his government, religious hate crimes increased with several high-profile cases of lynching of Muslims. I think the American administration understands how important the relationship with India is at the strategic level, especially now by, with Biden. India is so important that they've been trying to stay clear of trying to, to raise some of these issues. Washington shouldn't delude itself into thinking that uh, 
India will be a, a steadfast ally. Uh, India is big enough, proud enough and strong enough to pursue what is in its own interests. De-risking is dramatically altering global supply chains, resulting in sweeping changes across several regions, one of which is Southeast Asia. In Vietnam, industrial parks have grown at record speed in recent years, beginning from the time President Trump imposed large tariffs on China-made products. In Southeast Asia's biggest economy, Indonesia, rapid changes are also afoot. One of the largest and newest industrial areas is this, Morowali, located in Indonesia's Sulawesi Island. The floodlights at the Morowali Industrial Park stay on throughout the night. Around the clock, workers operate the site in massive factories. Morowali Industrial Park has its own power plants and even its own port and airport. 200,000 people work here. All activity revolves around a single core commodity, nickel. Just 10 years ago, this site in Morawali was dense rainforest and a small village of about 1,000 people. Today, the sprawling park is spread across 3,500 hectares and it takes 45 minutes to drive from one end to another. Chinese investment was critical to Morawali's growth, and it is Chinese stainless steel giant Qingshan that led the charge. Hamid Mina, the person at the center of the transformation from forests to factories, explains how it happened. He sits in Jakarta, with multiple cameras monitoring his billion-dollar business in Morawali. I began in 2006. At that time, uh, nobody interested in nickel. 2009, we cooperate with uh, China Qingshan in order uh, to supply them the nickel ore to China. So we start export on 2010. Then the Qingshan said, we are good in building the factory and producing. This is our know-how. You are Indonesian, you know Indonesian. Rule, regulation, everything. So we split our job. 2013, we start building a first factory. Without the Chinese, did the Indonesians have the know-how to process the nickel ore? No, we don't have the know-how. They have the technology, so we cooperate. The global growth in the electric vehicle and battery industries aren't the only forces driving Morawali's spectacular growth. Indonesia, the world's largest nickel miner, banned the export of nickel ore in 2020. It's a controversial move that has been criticized by the WTO, IMF, and EU. But the ban compelled foreign investors to build smelters in the country adding value to its metal exports and creating jobs. Back in 2014, our export of the nickel ore, before we ban the uh, uh, export, our, uh, our export of the nickel ore is only 1.1 billion US dollar. Right now, the export of the nickel product, yeah, last year, is about 34 billion US dollar. So you see the multiplier is very huge here. Yeah. Today, despite geopolitical tensions, companies from both East and West work here together to produce this 21st century gold. 
this year is the hottest news for electric vehicles. So everybody come and invest for the battery raw material. Now coming in every year almost five to six billion dollars investment. Mostly are Chinese, but also from Japan, from Korea, and from Australia. We don't do politics, okay? To me is we welcome everybody. You you want to come to invest, we welcome you. We don't care you are from the West or from the East. We are for the business, no politics. Yeah. There are big plans for Indonesia to move up the value chain. What the president has asked us is not only to create a strategy for the nickel downstreaming, but he wants us to create an ecosystem. We have this nickel, we have this copper, we have this bauxite, we have this cobalt. We want to create this one an ecosystem so that the downstreaming of this nickel, copper, cobalt, uh, bauxite, tin that we have, we process into this lithium battery material. We process this into an electric vehicle. Yeah, and then from this one, you know, we power the electricity for the industry using the green energy that we have. So we create an ecosystem of the electric vehicle and the lithium battery. In March 2022, President Jokowi launched the first EV assembled in Indonesia. It was made by South Korean company Hyundai. Hyundai is also working with another two South Korean companies to make EV batteries in Indonesia. Also setting up shop in Indonesia are Chinese EV makers BYD and Wuling. In July 2023, when Mr. Widodo visited Australia, he said that strategic cooperation with Australia on EV batteries was a priority. U.S. company Tesla has also been speaking with the Indonesian government about investments. So perhaps in the foreseeable future, nickel could be processed here by Chinese companies, assembled into EV batteries by South Korean and potentially Australian companies, and making its way to cars made by both American and Chinese companies. Demonstrating that in a world grappling with geopolitical tensions, global partnerships might still be the way forward. In November, Indonesia and the United States upgraded its relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. At the same time, China is often Indonesia's top foreign investor. So how will Indonesia navigate the geopolitics? Uh, the very first principle yeah, uh, for Indonesia is we are welcome to any country uh, for any investor to come to Indonesia. We should avoid a concentration of the supply chain into one single party. Yeah. But uh, I think in, in, in an effort to diversify the supply chain, we cannot exclude you know, single party and everything. So for example, if we want to uh, develop uh, uh, diversify supply chain, we cannot just say, oh, I don't want China. No, it's not possible because the Western country would be 10 to 15 years behind of the, this Chinese technology in terms of the nickel processing. So we cannot exclude. What we can do, we can have a cooperation that is beneficial and mutual yeah, for every party because I believe there is no single country, even no single region can fulfill all the critical minerals that we need for this energy transition. Kita sadar dunia memang tidak sedang tidak baik-baik saja. Tantangan masa depan semakin berat dan mengakibatkan perebutan pengaruh oleh kekuatan besar. Tapi ASEAN sudah sepakat untuk tidak menjadi proksi bagi kekuatan manapun untuk bekerja sama dengan siapapun bagi perdamaian dan kemakmuran. The outlook for ASEAN remains very positive. If we look at growth, I think the IMF has recently estimated that ASEAN will continue to outgrow the, the world average by a factor of 1.5. In trade, we get much larger numbers even. I think ASEAN is expected to outgrow in 2023 uh, the global average by like five, by a factor of five. Um, 
So the starting point, the starting issue so is very positive. The outlook for, for ASEAN remains very positive because it continues to be critical to the multilateral, multilateral trading system as we have it. But of course, there are downside risks. So far, it seems that um, ASEAN countries and economies are managing this really well. The economy continues to tread on a path that allows for ASEAN to trade you know, with everyone without being forced to choose between sides. So the positive outlook you're talking about depends crucially on ASEAN not being forced to choose a side. Exactly. Yes. It's the money, 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 make the world go round. She's the money, money, money every day. Kind of crummy how the money brings us down, down, down. When all the money, money, money run away. In the money, 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 working hard for cash. Making money, money, money every day. While we're running, we're still burning for that real big stash. In the money, 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 here to say.